Good morning, and welcome to the Promised Land Retreat Center. I am Jane Wagner. I am the interim pastor for Emmanuel uh, Congregational Church of Watertown, and this is our weekly worship service. And we hope that you will be blessed being here with us out in God's creation. Also with me today is Victoria Landers, and she is a member in discernment with the United Church of Christ. And also Leanne Bennett is here and she is doing the filming for us. We hope that you will enjoy this time of worship together and that in this moment as we play a, an instrumental prelude, we hope that you will quiet your heart and your mind and allow the sense of the Holy Spirit to enter in this day. Happy Mother's Day. Please join me in the call to worship. And Jesus said, come. To all mothers and all children, he said, come. To the motherless and the childless, he said, come. To all who long to be mothered, he said, come. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Please pray with me. Living God, long ago, faithful women proclaimed the good news of Jesus' resurrection, and the world was changed forever. Teach us to keep faith with them, that our witness may be as bold, our love as deep, and our faith as true. During this time of worship, we ask that your presence be made known to us. May our praise and thanksgiving be pleasing to you. Amen. Let us now join together as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Today's scripture reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 66, verses 12 and 13. For thus says the Lord, I will extend prosperity to her like a river, and the wealth of the nations like the overflowing stream. And you shall nurse and be carried on her arm and bounced on her knees. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I hope you're appreciating our um, social distancing here today. Um, last week we had communion and it was a, a little trickier to make that work out, but we are trying to follow all of the rules still in place. Today we talk of a mother's comfort. We've all been blessed, I hope, with a mother. So we all have expectations of what a mother should be. We expect mom to be there when we need her most Would you like to learn to and expect or at least now? hope that she is not to be there when we don't want her around. Mother is the person who knows everything that we do. And if she doesn't, you can be sure that sooner or later she's going to find out. As I was writing this, I was remembering uh, a time when my children were young and one of them, a teenager, um, had done something that I had explicitly said not to do. And so it was the hour of reckoning and um, I encouraged them to sit at the table and to tell me all of the details. And then I said, and before you do that, I just want to let you know that I already know more than you think I do. So I think I got the full story. I love the story about the frazzled mother who sent her little boy to bed and the little boy was mumbling to himself as he went up the stairs, how come every time she gets tired, I'm the one who has to take a nap? Or there's the one about the family that just had their fourth child, all under the age of five. Some friends sent a playpen over to the family and a couple days later they got a thank you note from the mother of the four children. It read, just what we needed. I sit in it every afternoon and read and the kids can't even get near me. <gasps> okay. Ah, it's good we didn't have any water in there. It was sitting up there, but better sit down. Just a few minor little glitches here today. It's a bit breezy again. I heard one just recently about a mother who had spent all day with her kids and nothing was going right. She was so exasperated and so tired and so frazzled. And in the evening, an evangelist from the church came and knocked on her door and she invited him in. And his first question was, how would you like to live forever? And the tired, worn out mom said, you know, I don't think I could really handle that. Or my recent favorite from Facebook, submitted by a young mother after four weeks of sheltering in place. And this is what it said. I'm telling my mother that I am tired of babysitting for her grandchildren. There is no job in the world that is as heartbreaking or as rewarding as motherhood. And no other job will have the influence or the impact on the world like parenting does. 90% of teenagers, when asked who influences them most, still say their parents. If you stopped 100 people on the street and asked them to describe God or what God looks like, many would use the word Father. Scripture encourages this outlook by usually referring to God as He. But scripture, in fact, has a number of passages 
which appeal to God with decidedly feminine imagery. In Isaiah 66 that Vicki just read for us, there's a striking verse where God, using maternal imagery, speaks to the generation of Israelites who have returned from the Babylonian exile to the ruins of Jerusalem. God says that the God of Israel is like a mother one can turn to. As verse 13 says, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. There are some who argue for a theology that includes not only a heavenly father, but also a heavenly mother. While there is little in the Bible to support that kind of a separation of God into genders, you can't deny that it certainly has an appeal. One writer, Taylor Ruinzion, has expressed this appeal in a poem, and this is a piece of that poem. I cry out without sound, to him I've been told is there, but my soul yearns for something more. He knows my pain, yes, but so does she, and a mother's pain needs a mother's comfort. But we don't need a God separated that way, because fortunately the Bible in this verse from Isaiah 66 recognizes that in God, the paternal and the maternal are both present. There's also Deuteronomy 32, 18, where Moses chides the disobedient Israelites saying, you were unmindful of the rock that bore you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. What's more, God's comfort is a strong theme in the Bible. Portions of two prophetic books, Isaiah chapters 40 through 55 and Jeremiah chapters 30 and 31, are often described as books of comfort. But the theme of God as comforter isn't limited to even those texts. We hear it in many of the Psalms as well. But the imagery here in Isaiah 66 communicates especially well. God comforts us like a good mother comforts her child. Now, we know that fathers can also provide comfort and children benefit from the tender love of a father every bit as much as a mother's. But we also know that when push comes to shove, when a knee is scraped or a hope is dashed, children often run first for mother, sometimes holding back their tears until her arms are wrapped around them. Having said that, we should note that in Isaiah 66, God was speaking and promising comfort, not to children, but to grown-ups. The hurts of childhood are fleeting, and often a hug and a few tender words or a little kiss are sufficient to supply the comfort needed. But the hurts of adulthood, the pain of loss, worry, illness, the realities of the human condition are another matter. And for those, we might long for comfort and help as effective as that which our mothers give us in our early years. That's why all mothers know that comforting a child doesn't end when they go off to high school or college or even when they marry and have children. But how exactly does God comfort us? For one, God comforts us through the presence, care, and encouragement of other Christians. And encouragement is something that all of us are capable of doing. A definition of comfort is to stand alongside and to, to lend support and encouragement when a situation cannot be changed. This is something that most of us can do for others and something that is so appreciated when others can do it for us. But God sometimes comforts us more directly even than through other people. The 
psalmist says, when my anxieties multiply, your comforting, O God, calms me down. How does God deliver comfort? Well, the ways that God will comfort us vary, but it sometimes comes while we are in prayer. It sometimes come through, comes through a verse or a passage that jumps out while we are reading the Bible. Or it might come over us as an inner assurance in the midst of grief. Many of us can remember our mother's comfort. On this day, some of us will still have mothers that we can call or mothers to whom we can send a card or a bouquet of flowers. We're grateful for our mothers. We are thankful for their enduring and unconditional love. We are glad that when we were children, we had mothers to whom we could run for comfort. But there are some who did not have such a mother, who lost a mother while young in life, or whose experience does not go along with God's description of a mother who comforts a child. To these children, we must make it clear that there is a heavenly parent who offers love and comfort in a way that they have never known. On the cover of Henry Nowen's book, The Return of the Prodigal Son, is a photo of Rembrandt's painting of the same name, The Return of the Prodigal Son. In the book, Henry Nowen has written beautifully about how he spent hours observing that painting, the painting of the father welcoming the lost son home. It finally struck Nowen that the two hands of the father holding his lost son were different. One is coarser and thicker, and the other is more slender and delicate. For Nowen, it represents the masculine and the feminine sides of God welcoming the son home cradling him in his arms. With that in mind, we give thanks for a God who with all the love of a mother and father comforts us. Of a God who encourages us and of a God who always welcomes us home. May it be so. Before Vicki gives the benediction, I would like to share with you a prayer for mothers. And as I pause after each phrase, you can say the words, or I will say the words, we pray to the Lord, and you can mention people's names or a prayer in thanks for your mother. Pray with me, please. For our mothers who have given us life and love, that we may show them reverence and love, we pray to the Lord. For mothers who have lost a child through death, that their faith may give them hope, and their family and friends support and console them, we pray to the Lord. For women, though without children of their own, who like mothers have nurtured and cared for us, we pray to the Lord. For mothers who have been unable to be a source of strength, who have not responded to their children and have not sustained their families, we pray to the Lord for those mothers as well. Loving God, 
As a mother gives life and nourishment to her children, so you watch over your church. Bless these women, that they may be strengthened as Christian mothers. Let the example of their faith and love shine forth. Grant that we, their sons and daughters, may honor them always with a spirit of profound respect. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Go into your week knowing that you are embraced by the love of God, a love that is sweeter and more tender than any you have ever known. Thank you.